Hi there, I'm John Iverson, your host on our uh, weekly video blog. As usual, I am joined by Andrew Balfour, Managing Partner at Rubicon Strategies, and Marcella Monroe, who is the owner-operator of WPM Public Affairs, fresh from bouncing around her apartment to a new Tragically Hip song. Apparently Pretty found exciting. on the cutting room floor in Saskadelphia? Saskadelphia. That's what they wanted to originally call the album. It's a pretty interesting story, actually. You should, you should read it this weekend. Well, it's tell us. Fun. Well, well long story short, totally they, had, they had seven or eight, eight tracks that didn't make the Road Apples album. And um, they finally found them 20 years later. Uh, and uh, apparently the band initially wanted to call it Sask Saska Fidelia, Fidelia because they felt like they never knew where they were. They were on the road so much. And uh, the network didn't like it. So they yep. chose road apples, which they thought would get rejected because we know what road apples are. Right. Right. <laughs> and they the, rejected uh, Saskadelphia, but <laughs> accepted road apples. Right. OK. Yeah. But I guess it was too Canadian and inside joke. So the network went, oh, OK, that's fine. Uh, well, well, talking of Canadian inside jokes, it's Habs the Leafs in the playoffs tonight for the first time in 42 years. And um, Quebec has initiated a constitutional spat. What could get more Canadian than that? So today we're going to talk about some of these things. We're going to chat about things that interest people, which is uh, reopening of economies, travel opportunities, vaccine progress, and then things that probably don't interest people, which are, are uh, uh, the federal constitution. At least it, it, it should interest us as policy wonks. And I think we can debate this, but I think there are broader implications to, uh, to the constitutional thing. Um, so let's start with pandemic. We're the Post Media is releasing a poll that we did with Leger uh, that suggests that 63% of people have less trust in the federal government. Um, a similar number saw trust eroded in, the pro in provincial governments across the country. And one third say they trust their neighbours less, which I found slightly amusing. Um, so taking those in turn, does the federal government deserve that spanking? I mean, vaccination rates are set to hit 49% today. Uh, we're on course for three quarters with one shot and one fifth with two doses by mid to late June. And, you know, I think generally th the feeling is that things are getting slightly better. So, Marcella, do you think that uh, the, the, the erosion of trust is fair for the federal government? I mean, I think it's probably fair for all governments. Um, you know, Canadians have been, as everyone has, right? So I don't necessarily blame the governments, but I think it's a pretty rational position to take if, if you've been going through this COVID nightmare with your family and struggling to make ends meet and struggling with your kids and trying to figure out what, you know, what to plan for and what to cancel. And that's been going on for 15, 16 months. I think it's only human nature that you're going to say, well, I can't, you know, my trust is going to go down because it's the governments that have to deliver those changing messages. So even if rationally you can say, yeah, you know, it's a once in a hundred year pandemic and you know, we're going to learn more each step of the way and, and the directors will change. The directives will change. We might have to have another lockdown. Um, I think it's just pure frustration of a constantly, you know, moving needle. And is it big? I guess it's not helped by the fact that they see, you know, Can uh, UK teenagers in a, at a nightclub and, and uh, US sports fans in hockey arenas. No. And but I mean, it's. At this point in time, everyone's pretty down and just looking to the end. I don't think that any of the numbers we're seeing coming out in polling right now will be the same as what we might see at the end of the summer. If, as we've seen in Quebec and Saskatchewan and now Ontario with reopening plans that outline what we will be able to do over a set period of time, I think that every incumbent government's numbers are kind of bottomed out at this point in time and are only going to go up. Uh, you know, as a, like personally, I look at it that you know, I'm finally going to get vaccinated uh, tomorrow, which is great. And, you know, I see the nice weather coming. And over the last few weeks, I don't think anyone's been loving life aside from having some nice weather, depending on what part of the country you're in but there's you know not so cool. much in alberta with that snowstorm yesterday no and and today this morning it was snowing as well but but uh, so the one thing that that sticking with the, the federal government i mean the one thing that does seem to uh resonate as a, an enduring complaint about the federal government was was borders and that might have a, a an impact in the 
in an election if we are, if we do see one this fall. Um, in the poll we had, half said they did not think the federal government's efforts have been effective. Marcella, do you think that's something that is going to be a factor? I mean, again, it could be. We're still looking at a changing target, obviously. I think the other number that was interesting there is over 70 percent said that they would be in favor of like stricter controls on land borders. Right. So people mm. are clearly quite ticked off. That might be the only breakthrough message uh, that Aaron O'Toole has had yet <laughs> in some yeah. ways. Well, that and rapid testing, I think I think rapid testing is another one he's hammering on, which sure, sure. The, n no government has done a great job on. No, I mean, it's well, it's not it's, very effective. I mean, the rates when you read through the like how efficient and uh, accurate the rapid tests are, like I, I don't then think we you're a typical Canadian bureaucrat if you think that that's that's the case. The whole the whole idea is that uh, perfect is the enemy of the good, and that, this is a tool. I mean, I realize there's a margin yeah. of error on them, but they should have been deployed. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, they, they are deployed help. everywhere else in the world. But I mean, yeah. with that said, I don't think, you know, I'm certainly not one to uh, often agree with conservatives on much, but uh, I think that what Doug Ford's been saying about requiring PCR tests for domestic travel, I don't see why that's such a big deal. Like, I'll go, like, if I can get on a plane knowing that everyone on it has not going to have COVID, <laughs> I, I'm okay going and paying well, to get it. Well, let's well, talk I, about think, I think honestly, domestic travel has been a way worse problem for us than international in a lot of ways. So I, I agree there should be more testing. On the provincial front, uh, Doug Ford is going to unveil his grand reopening plan uh, this afternoon after we've recorded this. Uh, we do know it's going to be sector by sector that um, there is the prospect of outdoor pursuits by the long weekend, which may or may not be a great idea. What do you think, Marcella? <laughs> Well, I feel like it's, you know, it's made two for that sacred of sacred of Canadian holidays. And now I feel like that little girl in the back seat, <laughs> little girl in the back seat saying, are we there yet? And, you know, the answer for most people in this country is we're not there yet. And so I think this weekend we're going to have a big problem. And if today, um, in my view, if, if, if Ford and co decide they're going to try to reopen some of the things everyone's been really um, annoyed that they closed in Ontario, it's just going to be a gong show across the province. So again, these, there'll, there'll be regional differences, but this is traditionally a huge weekend across the country where Canadians feel like finally spring is here um, and they're used to just being able to like, you know, go to co cottages, go camping, you know, go visit folks, drinking outside, all that stuff. Uh, I think that's going to happen kind of regardless of, of what the efforts are today. And I, I think we should be a bit worried about what that means sort of three weeks from now. Right, right. I mean, it, it's noticeable that Quebec's uh, loosening of restrictions kick in on May 28th. So they waited until after the, uh, the long weekend. But as you say, it may, not, uh, it may not matter too much in the long run. Well, but with that said... Again, I'm defending conservatives. I don't know what's happening today. But, like, <laughs> the, all the health experts are out saying that these outdoor activities are fine. Like, I'm not saying that people are going to behave well necessarily because, of, as Marcello said, it is the May long weekend. But, you know, let people go and play tennis. There's a net between us. I can keep apart. Uh, like, let people go play golf. My ball's probably in the woods. Like, it's like... But the, but the, the argument against that is that, you know, four four guys get in a car and travel to the to the golf course. And then have some pops. And, and then have some pops. Some pops. pops. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with, with, with golfing. The problem is the mobility. Then after golf, they go back, they have a few pops. Uh, and they do. I mean, I've seen that. So yeah. it's... Uh, I've done I it mean, it, it is, it is t it kind of amusing to me that the... The most vocal lobby in uh, for reopening, that that's uh, the most effective lobby, perhaps, is that there's the the golfers who've never protested anything in their lives until now, and then suddenly they can't go to the golf course. Well, I mean, it's pretty important. It is pretty important. We're, we're agreed I mean, on that. Okay, I'll, like, I'll, I'll be I'll be there in like three hours. Yeah, in <laughs> Quebec, which you probably shouldn't be, right? Let's not talk about that part. Okay, so let's get a little bit wonky. I mean, I think. Um, Francois Legault pulled a bit of a fast one uh, when he made this power grab um, over a new Quebec language law when he knows that none of the federal parties with ambitions in Quebec can possibly resist him. He, he wants recognition in the Constitution of Canada 
that Quebec is a nation, that French is the official language of the province. And I think the worry for constitutional experts is that the unilateral nature of this amendment um, and the fact that the Prime Minister of Canada seems to be all for it um, means that other provinces in the future might think it's okay to unilaterally amend the constitution and that Quebec will use this in future um, by saying, well, we're not just a province, we're actually a nation and therefore when there's a division of power dispute, we are a cut above normal provinces. I mean, are some of us making too much of this or is this a big deal, Marcella? What do you think? I mean, I I feel like it's sort of separatism through the back door. And, um, you know, I think that's really unfortunate that we don't have a national party that will take on that discussion, because as we know, over the over the years, um, support for outright separation in Quebec, even among francophones, uh, has been declining. And so I think there's probably a way to finesse this uh, where you come out and say, look, this is not going to fly and it's not going to work. Um, you know, we're always going to, you know, and to offer something up, you know, I'm not saying they, they don't need to offer something up. I also think there's a, it seems to me right now at, at my cursory look at the Quebec media, there's a bit of a moral panic going on that I don't think the data supports in terms of the fragility of the French language, right? So you're seeing um, it's, it's actually increased in terms of when you ask people, you know, what language do you most use at home, even with immigrants, it's, it's highest it's been, I think, ever. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't think there's, uh, there's, there's certainly a higher level of bilingualism in Quebec uh, than, they've, than they've had over the years. So I just think that that's also part of the problem, that we're not actually, even if, this, even if they can't resist this policy on a political level, someone should have the guts to stand up and say, but it's, it's just not the policy that's needed. Well, I think, I think inevitably this thing will be challenged in court and it will go all the way to the Supreme Court, so the federal government might as well send a reference right now. I mean, what do you think, Andrew? Is this a, are we making too much of this? I don't think we're making too much of this. This is like a big deal. Um, I mean, it's, it's not just symbolic, right? I mean, there is a, a, no. an intent here to, to grab some more power by Quebec. It's, well, yes, of course, but it's also, if you, like, we all love politics, and if you look at the politics of what Legault has done, putting this out on the eve of a big federal election where for the prime minister to get his majority government back, he needs to win votes in Quebec. I mean, O'Toole and Trudeau both had to just kind of go along with this and hope it goes away. It's a brilliant political move by Legault. And, you know, Legault doesn't care about the island of Montreal. He doesn't have any seats there, which is where the Anglo population will be pissed off. He doesn't care about West Quebec across the river from me and where you're sitting right now because he doesn't have any seats there. And those are the only places that people are going to be like really, really upset with the Anglophone population. Like he has you, no would, you would think the federal justice minister might be a little bit upset given he's an, an Anglophone uh, Montrealer. Right. I'm sure he deep down inside that he is, but he still can't come out. And as the Attorney General of Canada, he can't really tinker around on this because this is a province. What's he supposed to do about it? So here's the other thing that occurred to me that could be a real firestorm, not saying it would happen. But what if if in some bizarre move for whatever political reasons he had, Jason Kenney decides to say, well, fine, we're in English. English is our only language because we don't want to spend the money and the resources to be uh, doing any francophone education or anything else. I mean, <laughs> why wouldn't he? I, 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 well, exactly. And aside from the other 10 things he's going to want to say that the feds have no business poking their noses into Alberta. But I mean, that would cause a firestorm. And rightly so. You know, we based we've based our Constitution, uh, you know, since 1982 on this idea that we had come to an agreement that we we're a bilingual country. Well, we either are or we aren't. Yeah, I think, I mean, Pierre Trudeau would be uh, less than pleased, I would imagine, with his son on this one, for sure. Andrew? Well, it's, and it's not just, you use the Alberta example, that's a good one, but I mean, if you just look at all of the other provinces, I don't know that there's a whole lot of French in the territories. There doesn't seem to be a lot of French in Saskatchewan or Newfoundland. If And, you know, John wrote about this uh, earlier this week. The Newfoundland example, they're doing anything that they can to save money because they're 
going bankrupt. If they could make it so they didn't have to spend any money being bilingual anymore, I'm sure they'd love to do that too. But I would also say you can still do immersion, I think, in every province and territory. And that's because there's been a massive effort <laughs> uh, since Trudeau One's government uh, that that was an important investment. I mean, the, 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 the way that the government uh, intends to look at this is that this is Section 45 of the Constitution, which is uh, where provinces can do things that only deal with the constitution of the province. Uh, so, therefore, Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador were able to use that amending uh, clause to change denominational schools into language schools, in Quebec's example, for example. You know, nobody outside of that Quebec cared about that. In this case, it's not just the internal workings of the province. It obviously has far broader implications for the constitution of Canada. And therefore, I can't imagine that any court, far less the Supreme Court of Canada, is going to say, well, that's OK. You can, you can unilaterally tinker away to your heart's content uh, uh, and so can any other province. I mean, this just seems to me to be uh, uh, an accident waiting to happen. Oh, yeah. He's t I mean, basically, I felt like when I saw that what, what Trudeau had said about it, I was like he had <laughs> it reminded me of that Homer Simpson gif where he's pushing his hand into a hornet's nest. Right. Right. I mean, and it's funny because I talk, tried to talk to Michael Chong, who resigned from cabinet, from Harper's cabinet, over the Quebec, the Quebecois is a nation uh, motion that went through the House of Commons. I mean, he, he quit cabinet over that. I can't imagine for the life of me that he's very happy about this. And yet he was unavailable for comment. Surprise, well, I mean, surprise. Add, add that to the list of many things that the majority of the Conservative caucus are unhappy with their leadership about. Um, but no, and I was just about to make the same point. I mean, the reason that that happened that is the same thing that I talked about before. The politics of it and the need for Quebec seats, particularly back then uh, for the Conservatives in the Quebec City region, make it very difficult to like come out and oppose these things. Yeah, sure. And you'll recall at that same time that it was quite a contentious issue in the Liberal Party as well uh, that got, you know, Ignatieff in a bit of trouble too. Like it's not a, not, nothing to do with Quebec is an easy thing. For sure. Okay. I should, well, I should put in a call to my friends in BC because, because Horgan could come out and champion against this and it would be excellent for him in that province. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Well, who, who speaks for Canada other than the tragically hip? <laughs> You got to listen. I, I'm sure that song is just going to be the, the clip is amazing. It just yeah, brought had, me back to university. I, <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. So yeah, nice to hear Gord Downey's voice on a, on a new oh, song. So good. OK, guys, let's wrap it up there. Thanks very much. Happy sure. May 2-4.